increase your interest in volunteering with Habitat Chicago. During this video, you'll learn a little bit more about our history and our background uh, and what we're doing here in Chicago. We have a, a long series of videos that you'll be able to take a look at to get more detail about some of the things we'll uh, go over in this video. So here at Habitat Chicago, we believe that no matter who we are or where we come from, we all deserve to have a decent life. We deserve to feel strength and stability day after day. We deserve to know that we have the power to take care of ourselves and to build our own futures. We believe this is what unites us. We have a shared vision of a world where everyone has a decent place to live because we believe as humans, we are all uh, worthy of this um, and that every single one of us deserves to have the opportunity for a better future. It's a lofty goal, but it's what we're working toward. Um, and how did we get here? Well, we have to go back to the 1940s. In 1942, Koinonia Farms was founded as an experiment in Christian living by a man named Pastor Clarence Jordan. Now, this is uh, in America's Georgia, the rural town outside of Atlanta, about three hours outside of Atlanta. And at the farm, everyone, regardless of race, was welcome to come and work on the farm and be given equal pay. Uh, now, again, this began in 1942. So as you can imagine, desegregating, uh, desegregating housing in the rural South in the 40s, 50s, and 60s didn't come easy. Over the course of its first 20 or 30 years, the farm was uh, shot at. It had different buildings burned down. It was boycotted by the surrounding community. But Koinonia stood steadfast in its belief that everyone deserved to be treated equally and that all were welcome. In 1957, uh, shortly after one of their farm stands was burned down and Pastor Jordan was struggling to figure out how to insure their property, he reached out to Martin Luther King Jr. to ask what the, uh, his organization was doing and um, received this letter in response from MLK that the first paragraph was all about the logistics, how and where he could get insurance, and then the second paragraph was about inspiration. And so MLK writes, I hope that you will gain some consolation from the fact that in your struggle for freedom and a true Christian community, you have cosmic companionship. God grants that this tragic midnight of man's inhumanity to man will soon pass and the bright daybreak of freedom and brotherhood will come into being. Um, this was, again, um, a, a moment of, of just continued uh, perseverance for Koinonia Farms. Uh, and we're proud to say that they still exist. Koinonia Farms is still in America, Georgia, and it is still a place where all are welcome to come, work on the farm, make an uh, it, it, it equal day's wage, um, and be able to be a part of the community there. Um, so much like our lofty ideals, Koinonia Farms is, is doing great things um, and attracting really interesting people, including Millard and Linda Fuller. So this is Millard and Linda. They came to live on the farm in 1965. Um, and they came with this belief that those that have need needed capital, they don't need charity. And so the Fullers came and brought this idea to the Koinonia community of a fund for humanity. And so what the fund for humanity meant was that they would take in donations and use those donations to then purchase building materials. Then volunteers would uh, construct simple, decent housing, working alongside families that needed that housing. Those homeowners would eventually be able to take on that home and then repay the cost of those building materials back into the fund for humanity. There was no interest charged. Um, and then the funds that were put back into to the Fund for Humanity would be built by new building materials and uh, start on new houses with volunteers and those new home buyers. Um, and that cycle would just continue. Um, this concept they called partnership housing. Um, and if it sounds familiar, it's because it's the basic model that we use today. Um, Habitat for Humanity International, this is where it was born from. The, the Fuller's saw that this worked and they realized that they could do it ju not just in America, Georgia, not just in the U.S., but they could look at ways to make this work globally. Today, Habitat operates in nearly 1,400 communities in the U.S. Uh, and over 70 countries worldwide. Have the Habitat International family has helped more than 13 million people achieve strength, stability, and self-reliance through home ownership. Um, what's beautiful about the way Habitat for Humanity works in the world is that they were aware that um, different places have different needs. And so Habitat operates as an affiliate model, which means that we are all our own freestanding organizations, but we're all part of one big family. So we get to learn from each other, 
and we all share this vision of a world where everyone has a decent place to live, but we get to figure out what it looks like to enact that in our communities. There are some communities that um, really would benefit more or do benefit more from getting sanitation services or disaster relief services. And then there are some communities that benefit most from new single family homes um, or home repair or um, just neighborhood revitalization work. And so um, we get to figure out what that means for the city of Chicago here at Habitat Chicago, um, because it looks different than in rural Georgia or in Malawi, Africa. And so being able to be a part of that bigger picture um, and that um, vision of a world where everyone has a, a decent place to live, but getting to enact it in our own communities is a really important part of um, what makes Habitat for Humanity, the, inter the international family, so special. Um, so we've talked a lot about this vision of a world where everyone has a decent place to live. And so it seems important to take a minute and think about what makes a home a decent place to live. Take a minute and just um, use this blank space to think through what makes a, what, what do you think about when you're looking for a home? What would make some place a place you'd be interested in living and a decent place? You might have said uh, a few of the things that are about to pop up on the slide. You might have thought about its location for transportation. Um, or maybe you're thinking about where can I park my car? Is there a secure place for that? Um, its location in terms of where it is to grocery stores and your place of work and your friends and family. Um, if you've got a pet, you got to make sure you can, you're living in a place where you can have that pet. Is it, um, do you have a yard for your dog or is it a place that has enough space for your cat? Um, and a place for your fish tank, whatever that looks like. Um, what does the interior of the house look like? Uh, are you somebody that wants that open concept that's uh, so popular these days? Or um, do you want to make sure you've got a few closed off rooms, especially in this time of working, more people working from home? Um, what does that interior look like and how does it function for your family? Um, do all of your utilities function and are they affordable? Are they functioning correctly? Um, does it fit your family? Um, is it near your family? Things of that nature. Um, one of the big ones for us is, is it affordable? Um, are you paying more than about a third of your income toward your housing? If you are, then you're looking at it not being affordable anymore. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, outdoor space, um, what's the school district like? And again, other resources in your community. Can you get to a park easily? Can you, um, uh, if you've got kids or if you want to be on a sports league, can you get to where those things are happening? Um, is your home pest free? Do you have to worry about, um, you know, bugs or mice or anything of that nature? And then again, the neighborhood, what's the community around your house? Um, our home is more than just the actual physical uh, building that we're living in. It's about also what happens when you walk outside your door. And so um, you may have come up with some of these, maybe you have another list, but just that idea, it's important to be thinking about as you think about Habitat and, and the work that we do, what makes some place a decent place to live? Um, a few of the other kind of key factors or the, the kind of three big key factors when we think about a decent place to live and, and meeting housing needs are being able to make sure that housing is affordable, that it's available, and that it's safe. Um, so some of the issues facing affordability um, the cost of housing and transportation in Chicago has outpaced the growth of our income by 203% over the last several years. Um, in 2018, a study was done that showed that in order for someone in Illinois to earn, um, to be able to pay for a modest two bedroom apartment, they have to earn at least $20 an hour. Um, we've seen the minimum wage going up, but that's still $20 an hour is still quite a bit higher than um, what the minimum wage is right now. And so in order for a single parent to be able to afford a, an apartment that has two bedrooms for themselves and their children, they've got to be making at least 20 bucks an hour. Um, and we find that all over about half of all rental households are burdened by uh, paying more than a third of their income towards their housing. And so then it's, it's no longer affordable. When you're paying more than about 30% of your income toward housing, then you're making trade-offs in some of those other areas that are our everyday payments. So things like your health care, your transportation options, things like uh, your what food you're buying and where you're buying it from, things of that nature all have to kind of come into the mix of, of reconfiguring uh, your budget to make it work if you're paying more than a third of your income toward housing. We also need affordable housing to be available. Um, in Illinois, there are only 34 affordable and available rental homes for every 100 households that have a need for them. 
Um, we also find that uh, there have been studies that show that about one in 10 Chicagoans are currently facing a critical housing need. That means that they are facing uh, um, either an affordability, an availability, or a safety crisis. They're not able to get um, the, the home that they need. Um, and there's overall a shortage of about 309,000 units in the state of Illinois. Um, and so we know more affordable housing needs to be created. Um, and then we also think about safety. Um, we know that crime rates are significantly higher in neighborhoods where there's a high res uh, resident turnover. Um, having um, long-term residents that pay attention to their community helps to bring down those crime rates. We also know that school funding is tied to school enrollment numbers. And so when there's high vacancy rates or transiency where kids are moving from school to school, it creates a domino effect of the resources available to people in that community. Um, and families who live in quality, affordable housing experience fewer health issues. As we talked about in affordability, when we think about safety, it also has to do with our health. Um, and so being able to pay for those health, that health care, being able to pay for healthy food, being able to pay for all of those things helps to keep a family more safe. And so um, thinking about this, um, this is a lot to take in. Uh, and so what are we doing about it? Well, we work at a community level. Um, we are a neighborhood-focused uh, organization. We believe we in putting residents first. Um, so before we do anything in one of our focused neighborhoods, we take some time to survey the community and understand what residents uh, want. And then throughout the, the, our whole process of building, we're continually hearing from residents um, about not just what they want with our, uh, our building, but also some of the different programs we run to ensure that um, residents have the resources that they need. Um, we think in assets. We think about what is here and what can we build upon. Um, we believe in partnerships and locating partners that are able to help uh, help us better understand and also help us achieve these big lofty goals. Um, we embrace planning. We believe that it is imperative to be thinking long term um, and being able to make pivots and changes as needed. Um, but knowing what our, our five year plan is is really important. Um, and then the big picture is that we are investing in home ownership. We see value in um, creating more people that, uh, more opportunity for people to be able to own their own homes and, and, um, and accrue generational wealth and be able to um, be a part of um, this leaving a legacy of, of home ownership and being able to be invested in the community because of that. Um, we realize that the health of the city is directly tied to health and the well-being of its citizens and of its neighborhoods. And so um, we believe in, in being able to be a part of that. Um, if you want to learn more about all of the ways that we're investing in home ownership and doing these different things, you can watch our, our video that uh, goes over our program. So you can learn more about our home buyer university, our home care workshop, our neighborhood grants initiative, and um, our affordable home ownership program. Um, which is our partnership housing program. Um, so this is just a quick overview to give you some background about who we are and what we're doing and where we've come from. I hope that you've learned a lot and that you'll check out some of the other videos on this, um, on our YouTube channel to learn more about some of the other things that we're doing. Uh, you can also check us out on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, always sharing more about what's happening in affordable housing here in Chicago. Uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon.